So I'm going to be talking about um, uh, st structural load feedback in flight control today. And um, what I first want to do is give a background on um, the subsonic fixed wing project at NASA. So NASA is divided into different um, directorates, and one is the uh, aeronautics directorate. We always say that's the first day in NASA is aeronautics, because most people think we just do space there. But um, so what we're looking at is trying to reduce the environmental impact of uh, aviation. So we're doing that by um, increasing the, the efficiency um, of aircraft. And we also want to improve the mobility of aircraft in the airspace. So you might hear they're talking a lot in the FAA about next gen air uh, transportation, and that's um, the idea of being able to, to have aircraft fly more efficiently, uh, say closer spaced or um, uh, you're just using maybe regional airports, things like that. Um, so that's what we're doing. Why is, uh, first of all, there's a lot of unacceptable community noise. As the communities grow closer to the airports, um, people complain because <laughs> the jets are incredibly loud. I went out to Soldier's Hollow and I was hiking out there and I couldn't believe how much I could hear the, the jets going through the valley. I was just amazed. So we want to try and deal with the noise, but that's a really tough problem. Um, we want to reduce the fossil fuel consumption, so we don't want to be using as much of the, the fuel and, and hopefully um, uh, reducing the emissions with that. Uh, also, um, air transportation really plays a very key um, part in our economy. So making it efficient, run efficiently and safely is, is very important. And it's, it's one of the goals that NASA tries to address. So we're, we're, the way we're addressing this is to create prediction and analysis tools for designing uh, new aircraft configurations or um, looking at materials, um, components of aircraft. We're also developing concepts and technologies that will lead to improvements, um, say, in noise or um, emissions. And we're partnering with academia, industry, and other government agencies to achieve this. So one of the ways we can increase efficiency is by reducing weight. We don't have to he bring as heavy of an aircraft from San Francisco to Salt Lake City. Well, it will require less fuel. So uh, what we're doing is, is working on new fabrication techniques for large lightweight structures. So when they went to build like the 787, this is some of the first large, large composite structures that have been manufactured. So there's a lot of technology being developed there. Um, looking at lightweight materials, um, we're working on um, designing lightweight wing structures where you can actually tailor the aircraft shape to make it more efficient and uh, trying to eliminate heavy control surfaces. Because if you need a large control surface, you need a large actuator for that, and that takes, uh, increases the weight of the aircraft. Uh, they're using things like aerogels, which is in the middle there. Um, they're super lightweight. Um, uh, insulators that you can use for insulating the cabin from noise. Um, also looking at um, materials that can um, withstand heat so that we can have composites uh, in the, say, the fan blades of the engine that, are, um, that aren't going to distort as much when they're heated and um, can be lighter. So you want to go to lightweight material, but you also want to make it uh, temperature sensitive. Um, so I mentioned, the, uh, well, we want to reduce drag for increased efficiency. So um, one thing they're doing in the airspace is looking at formation flight for da drag reduction. So if you can uh, put the aircraft in an echelon, much the way the geese uh, fly in a V formation, you can get pretty significant drag um, reduction. And um, although there are issues with that, because then you have the, the vortices being shed from the upstream 
uh, aircraft, possibly creating problems with the, the aircraft downstream. Uh, let's see, looking at um, designing services that have natural laminar flow, so you're getting, you're getting um, better lift from the, say the, um, the, like in this case, this is a double bubble that was designed by MIT recently, and you have some natural uh, laminar flow on the wing bottom. So just trying to eke out every little performance uh, gain that we can. Um, let's see. The project I'm working on, we're using active air elastic tailoring of the wing to reduce drag during cruise. Now the, the aircraft wing is designed for some operating point, right? Generally, because it's a, a fixed wing. And when it's, when it's up in the air, you have loads on it due to the, the lift and the gravity, the weight of it dragging it down. Well, you burn up half your fuel. You burn <coughs> up a quarter in takeoff, and then you're, you're going from you know, 75% to 25% in your cruise. And so the, the weight changes a lot. And, and so the twist of your wing changes, the deflection. And what we're trying to do is create ways to actively change that during flight to make the aircraft most efficient. Um, and then a lot of work is being done with CFD codes and design analysis codes. So NASA's well known for their codes. We have a supercomputer at uh, Ames. I think it's the fourth largest in government. And um, so we have a lot of codes to look at uh, how are you getting these increases in drag, um, in not increases in drag, reduction in drag, um, increases in efficiency. Um, I mentioned engine noise, um, looking at, there's a lot of material science that's going on that I think is fascinating, um, looking at noise dampening materials, okay? And uh, these morphin, morphing chevrons um, were an, a new thing that uh, recently was added to the uh, engines and it greatly uh, helps with the noise uh, reduction. Um, I mentioned the fan blades, um, looking at integrating propulsion uh, and airframe designs. So we're looking at things like up here, um, they have the engines above the, uh, the body of the aircraft, above the wing. Can you explain what a morphing chevron is? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's basically just out here, the outlets, they're changing with the, um, with the heat, but I can't remember actually exactly what it was. Um, so I'll have to get back to you on that. Uh, let's see. So what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, the engines are above above the wing, so you're um, you're actually having less of the noise propagated from the engine propagated down to the ground because the, the body of the plane is um, shielding it. Okay. Um, so I mentioned the airframe shielding it. This is the uh, X48C. So the X48B, you've probably seen, it's been flown. Then they've taken this and they cut off the winglet, wing tips, the winglets here, and they put, put these little, sh um, sort of like a tail, sort of a vertical tail, uh, next to the wings, the engines, and um, the engines are again are above, the, uh, above the, the trailing edge, so you're shielding, um, reducing the noise that's propagated down. Um, it has a continuous mold line, um, which means along here, when you're, when you're changing the surfaces, you don't have any gaps, in your, um, in your trailing edge. And the gaps actually cause a lot of noise. If you have any cavities, that's where a lot of the noise is formed. Um, also, you can see here, this is uh, landing gear, and this is the noise being uh, shed from that. Because um, when you're descending in the aircraft and when they put down the landing gear, you notice there's a lot more noise. So we're looking at modeling that to try and see, is there something that we can do to reduce noise there? So things like landing gear fairings. Okay. 
there is there's also work being done um, with GE and NASA Glenn looking at an open rotor test so where uh, you actually have the rotor open so you get a lot more air flowing through um, it's questionable if that's going to help with noise <laughs> I don't think it will <laughs> but it, it can help a lot with emissions because your efficiency of your engine goes up with the, um, the ability to bring in a lot more air um, and we're looking at flexible fuel combustors um, so we can use alternative fuels and the Air Force is, is doing, and the military branches are doing similar things. So now, um, that's kind of like research that we're looking at in the future, and some of the places we're applying it is in uh, what's called the N plus two research configurations. So we have the idea of N plus one is our current configuration that we're running, flying like a 757, N plus two would be uh, in 20 years. Maybe this is the kind of aircraft we might see. Um, I think these would only be used for cargo because you don't have windows and people don't want to fly in a plane without windows, I don't think. <laughs> it's kind of unsettling. Um, this aircraft is a, a short takeoff and landing and it's cruise efficient. So it's designed to be able to take off on a, on a shorter runway, so this is would be used like for your regional flights. So maybe you want to go from Salt Lake to Cheyenne and um, you could use a regional airport. You know, I'm sure you have one just close by. You wouldn't have to go to the international airport or maybe you use a smaller runway. And these aircraft can land and take off at, at lower speeds. So at lower speeds, you need to have higher lift on your aircraft because part of the lift is generated by your speed. And so they have advanced um, high lift devices to um, allow them to perform. Uh, and then we've already mentioned about the blended wing body. N plus three is uh, 30 years out. And uh, a couple of years ago, a study was um, put on where there was a consortium of three partners three groups of university and industry and government. And uh, out of it came a couple ideas. This is the double bubble. And they basically took, the idea is they took two uh, aircraft and sliced them in half, kind of, well, split the, uh, the idea is that they split the uh, fuselage and squished it together and flattened it out. So you can see this is a, a wide fuselage and it's also um, flat, flattened. So you get some lift from the fuselage there. Um, this is you know, similar to the X-48B, uh, some of the aircraft we've seen before. It's called the Sugar Ray. Um, and then this is a truss braced wing. So it's a long slender wing and then we have these braces to prevent it from getting into flutter or, or bending too much. And I, I think NASA is going to be looking more towards this configuration in the, in the future. So now I'm getting to the part of the work that I do. Um, so I've been working actually with Dr. Bodson on um, flight controls and specifically the part of flight control which is called control allocation. So um, this is a a block diagram of a traditional uh, flight control system. So you have the pilot here giving inputs. Now the throttle inputs just go straight to the aircraft, but uh, the pilot will be moving the stick to um, command the attitude. And those commands go in through a stability and control augmentation system. So this is a, a feedback system uh, that, that will track the pilot's command and maintain the stability of the system. And if the pilot you know, has had too much caffeine and hits the stick too hard, it's, it's designed so that you kind of respond slowly so that passengers don't spill their drinks, things like that. So uh, it'd be different in um, a fighter. You would respond, the flight control system behaves differently, but it's, it's the same principle. Um, except also fighters, I should say, are, are oftentimes not stable. They're unstable by design, whereas a 757 is a stable aircraft. It's not going to become unstable just uh, without doing something crazy. So 
the stability and control augmentation system takes um, the pilot inputs and, and gives out uh, some sort of uh, desired command that the plane is supposed to follow. So in this case, I'll just be saying it's, it's acceleration, so it's, it's roll, uh, yaw, and, and pitch of the aircraft. So um, we're going to have these commands coming out. So it's how, how do we want the aircraft to roll, how do we want it to pitch, and how does it yaw? And the control allocation takes those three directions and it says, okay, what de surface deflections? So what do my ailerons need to do? What do my elevators need to do? What does my rudder need to do to achieve these commands? Um, so, for, and for example, if you're uh, using ailerons on the wing, you, you put them to two separate w ways, uh, directions, we call it differential. Uh, aileron to achieve a roll command. And so traditionally um, we've used ganging of actuators. So the idea is you use the elevons, which are the, the um, surfaces on the tail to pitch the plane, and the ailerons, which are on the wings, to um, roll and the, the rudder for yaw. And sometimes they'll use mixers. Um, so you use a combination of aileron and and elevator, say, for pitch. Let's see. OK. So then um, once we get to these aircraft where there's many surfaces and um, redundant surfaces where you could use some for roll and you could use them for pitch, then we can formulate the problem as an optimal um, control allocation. So in that case, what we have is um, Okay, and the terminology we use is we have an effectiveness matrix B. So this is a matrix that when you multiply it by a uh, deflection angle, it tells you how much um, acceleration, say, in the roll or pitch direction you're going to have. So if I deflect my aileron a certain uh, amount, a uh, certain number of degrees, that times the control effectiveness will tell me what's my, um, my roll that will be achieved. So um, in our optimization, we want to minimize the error. So AD is our desired acceleration. So we want to find the U such that when it uh, goes to the aircraft, so B times U, the effect of it on the aircraft will give me uh, an acceleration that's as close as possible to uh, the desired acceleration. And then we add another um, part to our um, cost function which is control minimization. So oftentimes um, you would have more uh, solutions, you'd have multiple solutions here for the error minimization. So then we have the control minimization, which forces um, a single solution. And typically we choose the control minimization where we have U preferred being zero deflection, because that's going to give us minimum drag and, um, and that's, that's desirable. So, and, and with this formulation, we can have uh, constraints on the control surface deflection, because you can only deflect your surfaces so m by so many degrees. So, um, then we need to think about structural limits, because we don't want to crank on a, um, a surface and, and have, it, um, have it apply a lot of forces to the wing and rip off the wing, <coughs> and no one has a good day. <laughs> So what design engineers look at is when they're building an aircraft, they look at critical load paths in the aircraft. And generally, they're concerned with bending and torsion in the wing and shear loads. Um, and they basically do uh, load limit tests. I mean, obviously, they use uh, software and simulation like that to determine their t limits. But they also uh, do ground tests where they bend the wings and do different things, and they um, do a lot of flight tests, uh, measuring, you know, they put strain gauges on the wings and measure the wing deflection. And generally, um, they start by just flying the plane in a very small part of the flight envelope, so where they know it'll be safe, and then they say they expand the envelope. So they uh, sort of go a little faster, or go a little higher, do more of a maneuver. So that's how they determine the load limits and, and um, 
what the aircraft can uh, safely achieve. And then based on that, they determine position and rate limits for the actuators. So um, the way the load limits are imposed basically is the uh, aircraft is only certified to fly in this, this what's called the flight envelope. Um, and so that basically restricts the um, errors. And there's some uh, robustness added to that. So you're not right at the edge of, of uh, of limits, so if you had a gust come along, you know that that would that would put you beyond. So there's a, a tolerance there. Um, but now, as I mentioned earlier, we have these new aircraft where we have multiple surfaces along the wing here, um, and you could use them for say pitch and roll. So we want to make it, uh, you know, we want to make the aircraft more efficient. It, there's no sense in carrying extra surfaces and actuators if we can uh, make use of, of other ones. In other words, not do the ganging and stuff, use this optimal control allocation. Um, also, uh, you know, we need to worry more, if we, if we reduce the number of surfaces, then we have to worry a little more about uh, saturation. So saturating the surfaces with rate and position. So if we don't have as much control authority and we start um, using all the services trying to achieve a command, then you could, you could run into saturation problems. And that can cause a lot of undesirable effects in aircraft. So let's see, I guess this is a repeat. So that's why we're doing optimal control allocation to deal with these issues. That's what. Um, but the problem is this, um, this formulation of the problem does not have any structural constraints. So it's possible that the optimization could d choose a set of control surface deflections that would um, cause the structural constraints to be exceeded. So what we did was we des designed a feasibility study to see um, can we use multiple control surfaces um, in an effective way and remain within the structural load limits. So the approach we did was um, take, we took a, a simulation of a 757 aircraft and um, we replaced the traditional control allocation with optimal control allocation with load constraints and real time structural load feedback. Um, and so we measured some internal um, or structural loads along the critical load paths. So the idea is we would have strain gauges or something to measure, uh, fiber optic maybe, something to determine the loads. And then we use uh, the aerodynamic models of the aircraft and the structural models of the aircraft to determine sort of incremental loads that might be added by surface deflections. And then we uh, rolled that up into a optimal control allocation problem. So some assumptions we made with this study, um, we're only considering static loads due to lift and rolling forces. So we're assuming that the lift is distributed elliptically over the wing and, uh, and we're only worried about uh, forces generated by the roll moment, not by pitching or, or anything else. And um, what we did was we took the, the load due to these due to lift and roll and applied it to a finite element model of, of the wing and tail. And I have a slide coming up on that. Um, we only looked at bending moments. We didn't deal with torsion. And we had just a, a restricted number of critical points. So we had these points, these are, this is the wing, these are ailerons, um, and we had load points, um, internal monitoring points here just at the inboard of each of the ailerons and at the root. And we had a similar design for the tail. So now um, what we have, we've added a finite element loads model here that um, is a model of the wing and the tail. And we have some load sensors in the aircraft that are feeding back to the loads model to say these are the internal loads. Um, and from, from that, we're able to calculate um, what we call a T matrix, which is the incremental load matrix, 
Um, so for a given surface deflection, how much of a load am I adding? Um, and we, um, the load sensors would only calculate a, a small number of load points, but uh, we're able to use our model to get out an, uh, additional points. And because it's not a real aircraft, the loads model is generating the, um, the internal loads, the sense loads. All right, so um, this is a little background on the, uh, this is the math part, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, the equations. So it's the same optimization problem you've seen, except uh, I'm just mentioning a couple things here. One is, um, you, know, you can choose different norms. Um, you have a choice on the norm that you apply to these, uh, to the cost function. And um, a lot of work was done uh, early on by Dr. Bodson um, using linear programming and simplex algorithms and interior point algorithms. And Peterson is a previous student of University of Utah who graduated, a graduate, I should say. <laughs> uh, so they did some um, really important work early on um, looking at the L1 norm. Uh, a person, Ola Harkegaard, used the L2 norm and active set methods. Um, and then uh, Dr. Bodson and I, I have been looking at uh, using an L infinity norm, a min-max norm, where you're taking the, we're minimizing the maximum deflection. Um, See. So, so now what we're proposing is to have um, is to have an L1 norm on on the error minimization, and this is um, the L1 has some advantages that um, it's it's um, we have a very quick algorithm to to find the solution, and we're guaranteed convergence to a solution. Um, but the problem with L1 is that it, uh, it uses the most effective control surfaces. So that's somewhat undesirable because you don't want to just use your outboard surfaces, um, for instance, because um, then you're going to have more drag. Um, so what we did was we put this L infinity norm on here. And as I mentioned, you're, um, you're sort of trying to minimize the maximum deflection. So you're, you have a vector here of all your deflections on your, all your surfaces, and you're trying to make sure that the, the maximum deflection is minimized. And that has the effect of distributing the load amongst all the surfaces. This is an idea that's used in networking to um, distribute the load from uh, along, yeah, from networks, in networks, yeah. Um, so, so we set the problem up that way, and then we added this constraint where we're minimizing, um, we're constraining the, the loads that were, the incremental loads that we're adding with the, the deflections um, that we're adding to the current um, internal loads. And uh, I just point out, you can also do load minimization. Um, as part of your cost function. But for right now, we're just looking at the constraint and this cost function. So this is the um, simulation we're using. And the GTM is actually um, a, it's a simulation of a 757 type body. It's not actually a 757, but it's, it's similar to that kind of aircraft. Um, we have a 5.5% scale model that was tested in a wind tunnel and at NASA Langley, they've, um, they have a, a, an, a, this model that they, um, it's a UAV that they actually fly. So they've done flight tests and wind tunnel tests. And then someone scaled up the, um, the model to, to be a full scale model. So that's what I've been working with the full scale. But the, the regular GTM is actually available to people through NASA. Um, so if, if you're interested and want to play around with it, it's, it's pretty amazing, and they have a lot of damage situations in there, so you can actually have the wingtip break off and different damage scenarios and see how your flight controller responds. Um, yeah, that's about it. 
Okay. And it has uh, six ailerons and four elevons, uh, a couple split rudder, and uses uh, stabs for, um, for trim. Then uh, the project I worked on, we developed a finite element model of uh, the aircraft. So uh, we had this vortex lattice model of the aircraft, and basically we assumed a constant thickness of um, slices of the wing. And from that, we generated um, beam elements. So we have uh, 19 beam, beam elements along the wing. And uh, you know each has six degrees of freedom. Um, and we're just assuming um, bending for the beams, although you could have torsion easily. So this is the mo what we modeled um, on the right here. Um, so we had both of the wings and the tail and the, the vertical tail. And what we did in, in the simulation, we, we first of all assumed static loads and static response. So we calculated the stiffness matrix K uh, for the aircraft offline, because um, since we weren't doing anything dynamic, um, we could just do that offline to make our simulation run faster. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we apply the, um, the static loads during the simulation to the FEA nodes. So, and then we calculate the measured loads, the internal loads um, from the deflections. So along each of these, we determine what's the total lift of the aircraft, and then what is the amount of lift that, uh, you know, take, assuming this elliptical distribution um, over the wing and the tail, and then we apply the forces along each of these nodes, and we apply the, um, the roll forces. And from that, we're able to get the internal forces. So oh, this is, yeah, just a similar um, saying where we apply the lift and then this is where we apply the, uh, the roll forces. So you can see on this picture, um, we're applying the roll forces, yeah, at these points, wait, no, at these points, <laughs> 14, 16, 18. And then we're measuring at the other points. So that was an assumption we made was that roll was, um, the roll moment is um, proportional to the aileron deflection. And um, so we have an overall roll moment that we know of. And then we say, okay, if this aileron here is deflected so much, then that um, percentage of the roll gets assigned there. And, um, and then we also, let's see. I think that's it. Right, and then the roll moments are just applied right along here. Okay, so then the integration with the simulation. Um, so we're looking at a uh, flapwise bending moment at the critical points. Um, we calculate them and they're passed to the control allocation program. And we use um, K inverse that stiffness matrix and, and the control effectiveness matrix to determine this incremental loads matrix. So what we actually do in the simulation, we're able to, for each surface, you deflect it down a degree and up a degree, and you measure, um, you determine what are the, uh, the forces that are uh, created by that. So you run through the whole simulation, like what's the lift, what's the moment, what's, apply it to the model and, um, and then you get out the force or the, the incremental load. And so we build up this T matrix that way. And, and surprisingly, this is all done in MATLAB. And surprisingly, we can do all this, you know, each time step, you're, you're doing all these calculations and it runs really fast. So it's kind of amazing. And, and some of this study was to see, is this feasible for us to look at, you know, real time using its finite element model to, to determine what are the loads and such. So um, I think I covered everything there. All right, so then we had a couple test cases we ran. Um, 
So we assume we're flying at 30,000 feet, Mach 0.85. That's kind of your standard cruise conditions. Then we looked at a couple cases. We had the normal case where we just had uh, normal load limits. Then um, wanted to look at a case where um, you maybe, so this was a safety case where we said, okay, suppose your outboard aileron is, uh, your out right aileron is, um, you don't want to have a lot of loads on it. You're not sure how the actuator is, uh, the health of the actuator, so you want to limit the loads. So we have a case where we limit the loads there, um, and you'll see the results. And then the other case was, suppose uh, your left outboard aileron, you're worried that it's going to get stuck. Well, you don't want your aileron to get stuck, deflected, because then you'll be rolling all the time. And um, anyway, so what we said was, well, then you don't want it to move, basically. So we restricted, we restricted that. And over here on the right is just kind of a cartoon showing you um, what could happen. Uh, you know, if, if you were to think of this aileron being deflected all the way, you, so you're doing, getting all your roll from that and you're not using these, well, it's possible you could exceed some load limits here. And here you would be using the three equally and not exceeding load limits. So this just shows you, um, this is the, what we do what's called a roll doublet. So you're just having, you're putting in a, a roll command. So you have the roll, the aircraft roll right, then roll left, and straight. And so this is the response of the aircraft. And this is, you know, totally reasonable response. You're not going to be able to roll right away as a square function. Um, this is in the pitch direction. And this is also quite reasonable. And this is your yaw. So both, uh, this is comparing uh, the normal case and the reduced load case, and you can see that the performance is fine. Now this is a plot of um, the bending moment at the outboard aileron. Um, and in the first case, the load limits were you know, above here. So this is the normal load limits, and as we do that uh, roll maneuver, you see the loads go up, and so on. Whereas in this um, case, we reduce the, the load limit to um, this value, and you can see that the control allocation is keeping the, um, the limits, uh, it's keeping the loads within the constraints. So that's good. <laughs> uh, this is just showing you how the aileron use changed uh, with the limits. So the black line is with the normal load limits, and the red line is with the reduced load limits. And um, what you can see here is that the third, the right aileron um, was deflected a lot more. Uh, it was used a lot more, so it was deflected more uh, when, we ha when it wasn't encountering the load limits. When it encountered the load limits, it, it moved a bit and then stopped. Um, and you can see the red up here is um, basically the other control services needed to take up the slack for that, um, the reduction in the use of that aileron three. Uh, this is the elevons. Um, I thought I removed that slide. Let's see. Okay, here's the case where um, we had the, um, the, right, the left aileron three had basically zero deflection. And you see um, that it's, it's not moving at all here, whereas it uh, normally would have moved around that mount. And again, you see that the other surfaces are, are achieving, you're achieving the command still just using your other surfaces. So that's sort of proof of concept. <laughs> um, all right, this, because I mentioned the norms and I think it was maybe, it's a little confusing, um, but this is a picture to show you uh, the difference of using an L1 norm on the control. So this was the part of the cost function where we had um, U minus a U preferred. So um, if we use L, the L1 norm, basically it's using the most effective surfaces. 
So your, your outboard aileron is, is the most effective because it has the longest moment arm. So, um, so in that case, you know, we see this effect where we're just mostly using that aileron three. Whereas if we have the L infinity norm on the control, then we're using all the surfaces pretty evenly. In these cases where you would just see red, it's because all the surfaces are piled on top of each other. So that's a, um, a case for using um, the L infinity norm. So I think, so the conclusions are just that um, the proposed framework worked well. We, we showed that we could have um, you know, a, sort of a real-time system. It wasn't truly real-time, but it was, it was reasonable to use a finite element analysis um, method with uh, structural load feedback. Um, we, we showed that the control allocation worked and the, the loads model. Um, we have additional work to do um, to bring this to flight test, which is a possibility at, at Dryden um, Flight Research Center in California in a couple of years. So um, for that, we'll need to work a lot with sensors, especially to measure the loads. And then uh, the model, the finite element model would probably need more work. So with that, oh, I have a video here. So I mentioned a lot about all the great, exciting things that NASA's doing. And this is, um, so a part, one project we're looking at is, like I said, having this continuous um, trailing edge. So a continuous mold line. So we're, we're talking about not individual surfaces, but the whole wing can move like a bird's wing. Um, and so some interns, some summer, I think undergraduate interns um, made this uh, wing, a <laughs> continuous trailing edge. So that's what your aircraft wing might do in 20 or probably 30 years. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So actually we're working with Boeing right now on, you know, a, a sort of, I'll play it one more time on um, something that's not this advanced, but uh, the idea is to use um, shape memory alloys. You can have these rods of shape memory alloy, and then you apply um, a voltage, and it actually will, it has enough torque to twist the control surfaces, and then we'll have a, we'll have a, like a skin. They have a skin of material, of, it's a metal, I think, that um, will cover the surfaces so you won't have the gaps. So we're working on this right now, and it's, it's pretty exciting. But it won't look as crazy as this one. <laughs> you won't feel like you're in a, uh, flying in a big bird or something. So I'd like to thank my collaborators. I did this work with Mark Bodson. We've been working together for three or four years now. Um, and then these folks uh, work at Dryden, NASA Dryden, which is a really great place. If, you're ever looking for internships, they do a lot of uh, flight tests and, and such on new exciting aircraft. Um, and then Contrin did the structural modeling. So with that, uh, thank you for spending Friday afternoon with me and uh, questions. Oh, well, that's why you're here, I see. Yes. Is there any question? Yeah, how do you construct your uh, your B matrix, your control efficiency matrix? Is that just done in the wind tunnel? Yeah, they would start, they would do th some stuff in simulation. So that's something that's kind of changed now is that we can use uh, computers like CFD codes to simulate a lot of what's going on in the aircraft. And so that minimizes the amount of wind tunnel tests, but we still need to do a lot of wind tunnel tests. Um, but the wind tunnel tests are extremely expensive, so there's not as many of those. But exactly, you, you basically, we, in this kind of uh, aircraft, you have um, your B matrix is scheduled according to your flight condition. So a different um, angle of attack and mock for your speed you would have um, different control effectiveness. So it's, it's just a lookup table is how it's implemented. 
And generally, that's you always have the flight control systems running about a linearized point, operating point. Okay, there was another question back then. Well, like I said, um, the B matrix, we basically are linearizing it. So at each flight condition, we're, it's, it's a linear matrix. And, um, and it doesn't change that much depending on, on your operating point. So of course, it's quite different at takeoff. But, and then there's a few points in cruise. But it's not like you're changing often. So it's always a, a linearized matrix. So it's a linear problem. and so. You know, if we can formulate the problem as a linear problem, it's, you know, it, it's just much quicker to run. So we need to be, have this run very fast. And we also, um, the FAA is very strict about um, new technologies and uh, certification of, of those. So having an optimization problem is, is going to be difficult to get it. Um, uh, Certified, and so you don't really want to go to a nonlinear optimization problem where you, you know, it's questionable how it would behave. I'm sorry, the last. This. Why is it the letter B? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, okay, so B, it's the control effectiveness. So B times U times your surface deflections tells you how much roll you get or how much pitch you get of the plane. So the plane, you have it in a state space. We represent it as a, in a state space model, X dot equals AX plus BU. And, um, and so what we say is that the, the BU is the part of the control surface that's contributing to the, um, to the, to the um, roll, pitch, and yaw of the aircraft, the states that we're measuring and tracking. And rather than using the measuring, the container is much better to activate the actual aircraft. We use a state space because it's much easier to simulate and model and it's just kind of standard. Yeah, flight control practice. systems are designed like this. Uh, all flight control systems are designed so that if you fly at a certain altitude, you have a linear description. And it's approximate, but yeah, as she says, it's a question of tractability. What can be done? But it also works. I mean, it's not, if it was an unreasonable assumption, then you couldn't design a control system that way. It is a reasonable yeah. assumption. And, and you says if you did a cruise control system, you'd have to know. If you push that much on the pedal, how, how much acceleration does the car have? Right? So, you know, it, that, there's probably a number like that that defines in a given car the relationship between acceleration and the push on the pedal. So, it's the equivalent concept here. Is there any problem with the drift? With drift? Okay. <laughs> well, you can always try to explain it to us later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. come up afterwards. So, the question is, uh, uh, I saw that the main cockpit of the, the critical room they met there, uh, you need some kind of uh, screen detection uh, device there. Then, uh, is there any sort of work on determining the reading of the device of value or the malfunction of those and for detection? Um, the last part I didn't hear. You're talking about is there a way to do fault detections on the sensor? Uh, no, I mean, for, for if you apply those device on the real aircraft, I think there must be a way to, to, to see whether the, the, the measurement of that device is all right or the, right. the device is down and the control system gives you some reaction for that. Right. So. Um, that's a good question because, say, you're looking at strain gauges. Um, they they're actually pretty temperature sensitive, and they can have a lot of drift actually <laughs> in their calibration. And so, 
Um, so that is a concern, is, is, is this a good measurement that I'm getting? And part of what we thought of with the finite element model, we can actually validate some of the, the measurement and compare it with our model. Um, but yeah, there'd be a lot of work that would have to go into how do we take those, uh, whatever sensor we're using, how do we take the measurements and, and trust them? You know, we're also looking at fiber optic sensors, um, where you have a fiber optic laid along the wing and you can get the deflections and, and determine the loads from that. Um, but you, that, there'd be a whole lot of work to be done <laughs> there, for sure. In other words, have you noticed minimums or maximums or yeah. are you running your control hour on that? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you have to be careful about how, you know, you need to have it run fast enough. Um, but I, I don't know, you mean like on an aircraft actually running it? Or yeah, in I mean, simulation? To be, to, to be able to use this if you were going to really put it on an airplane. Yeah. It, uh, you, and, and it, you know, maybe a, a sideline point that's not very interesting to you, but I was wondering if it could have been. I think that's all important. We haven't looked at it yet. That's it. like if we transition it to a flight test, they'll start, we'll need to start looking at that for sure. Yeah. And the Dryden folks are experts in that, so they would be, they kind of, tend, the way we tend to work with them is we'll work on the algorithms and test it to a certain point, and then the guys down there, are real, they have a lot of experience putting things on F-18s and f 15 and it's kind of crazy. Yeah, they have a test plane like that, so. The standard rate, I think, in flight control right now is about 100 times a second. Yeah. So that's probably what they would start with. But it's a good question. I think you haven't really studied that. It may be that mm -mm. it needs to be faster for this type, or maybe even slower, because of the type of signals that you get from the swing rate. But I know, like I mentioned the AirStar, which is the platform that uh, Langley has that's a, the GTM, and, and it has a really, sh it's slow. It's like 20 hertz or 30 hertz, and they have issues with that because of the speed, it's... It, it was a little slow, is that what you Yeah, said? it's around 20, 20 hertz. So that, they have, it, it's not very effective. Or, it, I shouldn't say that, it's not that. It's just too slow, so Absolutely. there's, yeah. Um, one more? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so, so traditionally, you know, these airplanes had something called a, manu a maneuvering speed. And maybe you're familiar with that or not, but from a pilot's perspective, that meant that he could apply full full control deflection mm -hmm. at that speed or below without breaking the airframe. You are fixing that, is that? I mean, that would be one of the outcomes of what you're doing, is that true? Right, so, right, okay, so you're saying fixing it in the sense of helping. In the sense of, you know, there used yeah. to be a number, and, and right. you, you had to slow to that number if you were expecting to apply full control source. Yeah or if you're expecting severe turbulence. And, and so it sounds like, you know, you'll do whatever you can with the control surfaces at whatever speed you are at. Right. You would still have the maneuver load limits, but they would be um, effectively higher. You could achieve more because you're using another surface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. The, the use of the redundant surfaces. But unless they downsize the effectiveness of the surface, then you're back in a similar case, but yeah. So are you a commercial, uh, private pilot? Commercial. Commercial, pilot. commercial, yeah. okay, yeah. But so much of it now is fly by wire, right? Yeah, so. and, and that's why this is interesting because it's, it's totally belong beyond what any pilot knows. I and mean, you just know these simple things and, and you're fixing a lot of the simple benchmarks that people have relied on. Yeah, and, and the study we were doing, we wanted to make sure it wasn't a maneuver load that was causing the loads to be exceeded because that, it doesn't seem like a fair comparison. Um, so that's, that's also something we considered in choosing our study. All right, well, I think we'll close it here and let's thank again Dr. Frost. Thanks. Thanks.